Now there's a historical point worth talking about here, and one that could come up on an exam. Once upon a time, before we even used television displays, there were things called bistable displays. These were CRT screens, just like your television. However, instead of being able to display a whole grayscale, they displayed only black and white. Either the pixel was on, or the pixel was off. In a way, we can imagine that as saying the number of bits per pixel was one bit, either zero or one. Now, when they started thinking about how to think of grayscale, rather than go to straight imagining bits per pixel as we're talking about, they said, well, let's imagine each bit is an entire bistable display and that we're layering these displays to give different shades of gray. According to that analogy, the number of bits encoding a pixel is the same as the number of layers we use to achieve a certain number of shades of gray. So again, the number of bits encoding a pixel can also be called the pixel depth. As the number of shades of gray increases, the pixel depth also increases. Let's pause for a question. Which of the following would improve contrast resolution? A. Increasing the number of bits per pixel. B. Increasing the number of pixels in the scan converter matrix. C. Using a bistable display. Or D. Decreasing pixel depth. You may pause to decide on your answer. The answer is A, increasing the number of bits per pixel. This is a really important point, and so if you didn't get this answer, you may want to skip back earlier in the lecture and re-listen to this segment. Again, contrast resolution is how close can different objects be in shade and still be able to tell them apart. And it is primarily a factor of the number of shades of gray, which is a factor of how many bits encode each pixel. So this digitized signal is being stored in the scan converter, and we're slowly assembling an image. This image is displayed on the monitor and saved in memory as rows and columns of pixels. Again, that's picture elements. We've already described how, the sh how each pixel can be assigned a shade of gray as a number value. Now we're talking about rows and columns of numbers, which means that the image is stored in the scan converter as a matrix. You may remember these rows and columns of numbers from your math classes in high school. So how many pixels do we need to have in memory? It's a good question. Well, the more pixels we have, the more detailed an image we'll have, and the more spatial contrast we can have. For some context, a regular non-HD TV has around 720 columns of pixels and around 480 rows of pixels. So a regular TV is 720 by 480. When you talk about a 720p HD TV, you're talking about a TV that's 1280 pixels by 720 rows of pixels. A 1080p TV is 1920 columns of pixels and 1080 rows of pixels. Again, the more detail you have, the more pixels you have, and vice versa. At this point, we have an image stored in memory that's in composed of rows and columns of pixels. Strictly speaking, we've finished talking about the primary role of the scan converter. Now that's not all we need to have to have an image worth having. We still need to talk about pre and post processing, which we'll talk about soon. But there is one last function that usually happens in the scan converter that we'll like to talk about before we move on. The scan converter can also take us back from digital to analog. Why would we want to do this? We spent so much time and effort getting this into digital. 
Well, many ultrasound machines, especially older machines, use a display that's a television screen. And television doesn't actually display a digital image. It requires voltages, which as we talked about earlier, is an analog signal. So, we have a digital to analog converter that flips those numbers back into voltages for use in display. Now, on to pre-processing and post-processing. Remember that we've just discussed one part of the role of the scan converter. We still need to discuss some things that happen in or around the scan converter. The image we have now is composed of rows and columns of pixels, but we still haven't filled in the gaps or shaped the image correctly. We still have something that's very similar to what the transducer handed us, and not that much like the image we see on the screen. Well, all of the signal processing that converts from what the transducer sees to what we see is pre-processing or post-processing. And it can be divided up in a variety of ways. A good definition to think about these two things is what I have up on the screen here. Pre-processing is signal processing that happens before or inside the scan converter. So that's anything that's done to a raw signal. Anything that's done while we still have those A mode image lines. And anything done to transducer type images. Post processing is anything that happens after we're done with the scan converter. We've stored an image in memory and now we're just messing with it. This is a very confusing area and so I want to give you some tips and tricks to recognize whether something is pre-processing or post-processing. If we're talking about anything that's right something, it's pre-processing because we're using the right part to mean writing into memory and we can only do post-processing after it's been written into memory. If it's called receiver anything, then it's pre-processing. Again, receiver gain, receiver focus, receiver compression, all of these things happen before we've written an image to memory. In contrast, if something is called read anything, it's post-processing. For example, most machines have a read zoom option. So why would we do something in pre-processing versus post-processing? Well, there are some things we have to do in pre-processing. There are just some things we need to have done before we have an image. And there are some things we have to do in post-processing. There are some things we need to have an image to do. But there are a lot of things we can do either way. And why would we do it as one or the other? Well, one of the advantages of post-processing is that it's done in memory. So we can undo whatever we've done to take another whack at it if it's not the right thing to have done. One of the advantages of pre-processing is that it's generally faster, less computer intensive. Post-processing requires larger file sizes and more computer storage, so pre-processing is kind of a lightweight by comparison. Here's the thing though, contemporary computers are very fast and have lots of memory. So if we can do something in post-processing, we generally prefer to do it in post-processing. 